All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I am going to wait a minute or two as everyone kind of files in. But thank you so much for being here for Liquid Margins 48, our special Halloween edition. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. I think there's a few more people um, kind of logging on, but I will go ahead and get started. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this Liquid Margins is titled, Don't Let Disengaged Students Haunt Your Class, How to Revive Engagement with Social Annotation. And we do have some Halloween spooky themed questions um, for our panelists here. So um, hopefully uh, hopefully that is uh, amusing and engaging for you all. But I will go ahead and get started. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. If you have any questions about um, for the panelists, feel free to drop those into the Q&A um, section in the bottom navigation bar. Um, and that way we can receive your feedback, questions for the panelists, and we'll respond to you in that way. So if you have any questions, um, again, put those into Q&A and also feel free to share where you're coming from. Um, we always love to hear that, as well as if uh, you are an experienced hypothesis user or new to the tool, that's always great to know too. And then also uh, to enable closed captioning, um, do select the CC icon on the bottom of the Zoom menu. And if you do have questions about that, feel free to drop those into Q&A as well. So, and thank you all again for joining us. I see those, um, those sharing in the Q&A, so I appreciate that. Um, just a quick note, so my name is Jessica George. I'm the Customer Experience Manager at Hypothesis. I may have um, met some of you through various workshops at the start of the semester, um, but always good to see you all. Um, I do have instructional design background as well, so pedagogy conversations always are quite exciting for me. Um, on our panel today, and I'm really appreciative of um, both of these panelists for joining because it is such a busy time in the semester. Um, we have Dr. Ashley S. Love. She is the Director of Graduate Studies at the University of the Incarnate Word. Um, always has great ideas about adult learners, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about um, that in our Q&A today. And also Jennifer Joswiak, Professor in the English department at Allen Hancock College. Um, so uh, great tips for um, writing classes that I'm also very excited to hear about. And um, so we will go ahead and get started. And I am going to actually stop screen sharing um, so that you see all of us in um, full view. And I will uh, go ahead and pull up my first question. So let me go ahead and stop sharing. So um, maybe I'll go ahead and start with um, you, Jennifer, since you're at the top of my screen. Um, so what first drew you to using social annotation? And for those of you who may be new to hypothesis social annotation, social annotation is the idea that um, teachers and students can collaborate in the margins of digital texts or on top of digital texts. So I thought I would just mention that if um, anyone is new to that idea. So I'll hand it over to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Yeah, great question. I, I started teaching online in 1999, which was really, you know, ages ago at this point. And over time, you know, online teaching has gotten better and better with more tools that you can embed. Um, but still, I found that engaging with students was hard to do 
um, as an online instructor and less and less uh, students use email. And so to engage with students really kind of left us with the discussion board. And I didn't find that that was effective enough. So um, I really wanted to build more uh, personal connections with students, but I also wanted to get rid of redundant questions. And so when you can all have a discussion on a particular document, um, especially the syllabus at the very beginning of the class, and you can handle those questions up front, I found that Hypothesis was you know, really effective for um, creating that forum to engage students and let them feel que ask questions and feel comfortable doing so. Thank you. And I'm going to ask the same thing of you, Dr. Love. So what first drew you to using social annotation? Oh, thank you for the great question. And I have to say Halloween is my favorite holiday. So my, <laughs> my answer may have some Halloween themes and uh, please note that I don't speak like this every day, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was bewitched uh, by social annotations ability to um, turn ghosted assignments. So a lot of sometimes students uh, are not engaged a lot, especially in a dense peer reviewed articles where I'm dealing with graduate students where we're assuming that they know how to read a lot of peer reviewed complex articles. And it has allowed me to interact and have dialogues uh, with students uh, like Jennifer, I started around the same time on the online um, uh, setting as well as high flex and um, hybrid and face-to-face um, -face where engagement was a factor, especially in face-to-face, -face, it's a little bit easier, but in a high flex hybrid setting, um, you need some kind of tool to engage and also avoid that redundancy that Jennifer was talking about. So. Um, hypothesis allows us to wrestle these uh, redundancies. Even if you have FAQs, you have a document or something that kind of ground us to um, talk about the same topic on the margins and transforming some of the daunting <laughs> academic task into a, a community experience. So thank you so much for that question. Thank you both. and. So this, this second question, I think, draws upon a lot of what you already mentioned. I really appreciate that idea of the students um, or ghosted assignments. Um, but what are some eerie challenges, to draw upon the Halloween vocabulary here, what are some eerie challenges you've faced with student engagement and how has Hypothesis helped you tackle them? Um, and I guess uh, since we covered a little bit of this in the first question, are um, how how do you kind of manage student engagement in the margin? So like if you can say more about how you develop conversations or how you have students develop conversations between each other. I think the um, participants would, or audience would love to know more about that as well. And um, I'll, I'll hand this back to Jennifer. Sorry about that. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I think with my online instruction, I found that a lot of students were trying out online just to see if it would work for them. And, you know, these students, I'll use, I'll use a spooky word, they haunt the class. So they might do some assignments and then they will skip out on others. So what I was finding was that they, they wouldn't really engage with the more difficult assignments since I'm a writing composition teacher, you know, doing the first essay, which is a lot of points um it's a scary assignment for a lot of freshmen you know first time first generation students and so i found that having these you know low stakes hypothesis assignments where i'm getting to know them so i'm engaging over the syllabus and maybe i'm engaging over some other you know beginning type of assignment just to get them feeling comfortable in the class 
And then when it comes to um, viewing, you know, the major assignment, um, I do hypothesis assignments just to go over the guidelines to make sure that everything is clear and it's understood. Um, then I see that, you know, students are more likely to write that first essay when they've had a chance to ask questions about the assignment and maybe they can see that it's not as intimidating as they they thought it was at first um, just because it is for a lot of points so i tend to do a lot of low stakes grading with hypothesis to encourage the engagement and that seems quite effective i love that idea of maybe those big summative assessments being scary in themselves for students. So I hope to rehash the spooky vocabulary. <laughs> You're kind of making that less scary for them through these formative opportunities. And would you say the, um, the more kind of process oriented conversations that happen in the margins warm students up to the idea of summative assessments later on or like how do you see the relationship or students relationship with those later assignments? Yeah, I think, you know, especially with the first writing assignment, they get to see what the expectations are. And then I see them engaging over, you know, their questions for one another because I require them to post their own um, statements, but then also to reply to others. So the replies are really important. So they can see that, you know, their fellow student is asking the same question or has the same concern. You know, it's, it's really that idea of building community so that they can see that they are there to help one another and they're in this together. And so the more you can build that engaged learning community, I think the more effective your, your online class is going to be. Awesome, thank you. And um, Dr. Love, I'll, I'll hand the same question to you and then we'll get to the Q&A. Um, but um, some challenges you've faced with student engagement. Um, and I would love to know more about your perspective as someone who works with adult learners in particular. Yeah, of course. Um, there's a lot of ghost of self-doubt. Uh, there's a lot of imposter syndrome as well. Um, I um, am the director of uh, master's and PhD uh, program in our university. So um, at that point, adult learners feel like, oh, I should know this coming into the program. But in essence, if you're a first time graduate student, sometimes you don't really know what a master's thesis or dissertation proposals are. So what's been really, really useful, um, and I teach the fun classes, I teach the stats, advanced statistics, research, uh, design, and questions where there's an art and science to it. Um, both Jennifer and I have been in the field for a long time, so it comes naturally because of practice. And also we have that collaborative um, network of folks that we have worked with over the years. But right now, I think there's a lot of um, self-doubt. You don't want to look like you don't know the things that you should know. So using the margins, it has allowed me to give some guiding lights and allow people to also share their work. I know I have a hard time sharing my work because I'm a perfectionist. Therefore, I'm like, oh, I don't want that grammar to or that sentence that is you know, awkward or whatever, but I try to also open up and share my work and tell them, well, this is my first draft. This is what it looks like for me, even with someone with a doctoral degree, like what you're seeing is my 10th or 11th or 20th draft, but, and it's okay to get all the feedback. So it's been um, a very collaborative progress in terms of writing uh, you're not writing alone, but also going through some of the peer reviewed articles together. And I would pose some questions like, what do you think about, you know, this introduction? You know, is it giving that um, information? Is there, are they filling a gap in the literature that, you know, they're um, proposing to do? So, and we go through some of the hard stuff like statistical analysis where people are like, oh, I don't want numbers. And also writing, academic writing is an art, what Jennifer does as well. So it's been um, a game changer for me, uh, for me to kind of show and tell. And also, um, I think it's 
for even for me, I went back to school 20 years ago just to get an idea of what it feels like to be a full-time student after having um, all the experience. It's hard to get feedback uh, from others, even if you've been in the field and you have to kind of detach yourself from taking it personally. But if you have a collective student saying, hey, this sounds, Ashley, this sounds kind of unclear. And it's if it's not just the professor saying it, and all your, you know, 80% of your peers are saying, uh, ah, not sure what you're saying here. It allows the student to know it's like, oh, there's a clarity problem or a logic problem. It's not just Dr. Loves, <laughs> you know, these. So it's been, it's been wonderful in terms of getting people to receive feedback in a positive way and a constructive way, and then moving forth to make more progress and seeing the before and after effect. Awesome. So when you um, are referring to students providing feedback on a text, are they then using this um, in kind of a peer review type way as well? Yes. And so, okay. uh, yeah. So um, because it's static and it's a PDF, I convert all the word files into PDF files. So they have uh, one iteration and then another iteration when they do incorporate the feedback. We have another session where we go back and forth. So it's been um, uh, process evaluation all throughout the course to kind of show this is where you started. So pre and then post. So we celebrate the wins and also kind of also pointing out the trend as well in terms of, oh, you're not, you keep on missing this, but in a way that's very constructive, more collect collaborative and collective way. So we're moving everyone forward as opposed to someone kind of suffering alone and trying to figure out, oh, can I ask this question? And it's like, you know, three weeks before the you know semester is ending, you know, so uh, it's been a really positive uh, progress. That sounds like a, a really like empathetic type of peer review journey that a lot of us don't get, I think, in undergrad or grad school. So um, thank you for sharing. I'm going to dip into the Q&A because it looks like there's a couple of um, really good questions here. And uh, the first one is curious if the panelists have reduced discussion boards and replaced with social annotation assignments, or if you use them in addition to discussion boards. And I'll say that um, I've seen people use it in both ways, but I am curious uh, how you each use them. So I will first pose that to Jennifer. Actually, um, yeah, that was a question on, uh, I think, spelling away the ghosts. So yes, I have replaced discussion boards on a few of my assignments, um, especially for my linguistics class, where we are looking at a particular document. We just had a chapter on sociolinguistics where we examined um, Dr. King's dream speech. And so I created a, a framework for them to, you know, look for certain, certain terminology and um, as a whole on um, with, you know, just examining that document, it was just a really magnetic way to engage students about all of the facets of that speech. If, if we had done this in a discussion board, it would have been very disjointed and awkward and students wouldn't have really been able to see everybody's postings and engage with them. But with Hypothesis, we're able to do that all together on the same document and it's really, it's really effective. Thank you. And it seems like for that kind of a rhetorical analysis, having the text there seems extra important. Um, and there's something about the theme of that text as well. Having the whole community there on the text seems also additionally useful um, and, and important. Um, uh, Dr. Love, how do you use discussion boards and annotation? Do you use them in complementary terms? Um, yeah, feel free to. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I always think about um, how much the students have to, like, what is our main objective? So some of the classes, definitely the discussion boards have decreased because hypotheses have been wonderful, like what Jennifer was mentioning, and um, 
Jessica, what you're mentioning about getting the theme, getting the concepts, et cetera. Uh, so I have definitely uh, reduced because the I think the whole purpose of the discussion is um, out of the class, um, you want to engage the students on the materials. So, um, so yes, overall, it has decreased in my class uh, for the traditional discussion boards. And students are also mentioning that uh, it's easier, more interactive to work with uh, hypothesis because the hypothesis it's not just text you can also annotate videos and other things so um, it's been um, it's been a wonderful easy tool that was another thing the ease of just clicking in if you're uh, working with LMS uh, like Canvas uh, it's been very very easy to uh, for e faculty and also students to adopt it and then utilize it without any kind of a lot of instructions on um, any of the parties. Thank you, Dr. Love. And yeah, I will um, say that um, Jennifer and Dr. Love are both using Hypothesis as the LMS app, um, which many, many schools are partnered with us. So you can actually enable Hypothesis directly in your LMS. So this could be Canvas, D12, Brightspace, Blackboard assignments um, without having to send the students outside to a different platform. This is all happening within the LMS. So I thought I would just mention that. Um, Jennifer, there's a question that's specific to the assignment that you just described. So I'm going to jump down to that one and then I'll come back to the questions that are still in the Q&A. Um, so what were some of the things you included in the framework that guided students as they annotated the MLK speech? Sure, so I was looking for um, specific linguistic acts. So we were examining um, alliteration, and um, you know the references to specific um, historical um, occurrences that you know Dr. King refers to in his speech. So we were analyzing it for um, AAE or African American English also, and we were just. Um, I think I had five or six different things that students were supposed to be looking for in terms of linguistic acts. And so their requirements, I think, were to um, notate four and then reply to two classmates. So um, it was very it's very specific in my evaluation. I include rubrics that really helps me go in and then do that grading within my Canvas LMS. And so I can see all of their work and I can easily see whether they um, met the requirements or not and then assign them points. Thank you. Um, I will jump back into Q&A and um, the person who asked that question says that was a super helpful answer. So thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so I'm going to jump up to a question at the top. Um, I've seen a huge decrease in students actually reading, sometimes opening digital materials and asynchronous online classes over the years. I'm curious about Hypothesis as a way to scaffold engagement with primary materials. Um, but I'm also concerned there will be similar problems I have elsewhere with um, AI generated content. Uh, curious to learn more about the art you've developed to elicit authentic responses beyond I agree um, or AI. Um, and before I hand this over to our panelists, I'll just plug our blog, which has some ideas about this as well. Um, we have a recent post on digital reading um, and then also on specific forms of open-ended questions. So if you wanna take a look, feel free to check out the blog as well. So I will um, route this back to Dr. Love um, first. So authentic engagement and anything you wanna say about digital reading as well. Well, definitely. I knew uh, before using Hypothesis, um, a lot of our adult learners, not because, well, uh, they would read the abstract, but not necessarily the whole article. As <laughs> And what Hypothesis has allowed us to do, or uh, at least for me and my students to do, is definitely scaffolding, kind of walking through the article and having um, targeted questions on the margins for them to read. 
And it allows um, that motivation as well as also uh, the social annotation. Also, you see who has uh, posted <laughs> and also their due date. So it also allows students to um, read the article and deeply think about some of the articles because you see the questions and we have a list of um, model questions and comments that you can use, especially if you're a first timer and kind of modeling what you need to do. Cause sometimes you don't know, like what are you supposed to put on the margin? And the professor is saying, don't put, I agree. <laughs> you know, it has to be something thoughtful, but being thoughtful, that's also kind of subjective too. So we try to model and use the article to kind of go through uh, some of the complex um, concepts first and then allow our students to do that. But while well, Jessica, I'll have to check out those uh, blogs and um, paper to get more ideas. But in terms of AI, um, AI is going to be utilized by our students, whether or not uh, we ban them, we you know control them whatsoever, but I, it's a tool. So I believe that it is our, as a faculty and as, um, uh, people in our profession to actually know the fundamentals of AI to guide our students because it's one of the skill sets that they need to have in the workforce if you look at the industries out, out there. So I think what we need to do is also guide them in terms of, you know, um, show them what an authentic open-ended questions may be like, and then also ask them to generate them on AI and then also put that comments in and have that discussion of, hmm, did the AI did a good job or is it, was your prompting? Cause it's all about prompts and what you're asking it to do. So I think there's a lot of things that we are um, learning as we go. And just with a collective, uh, with all of us working together to figure out how do we elevate this critical thinking? Because it does free up some of our time to think about that reading um, and also critically thinking about some of the things that a ministry, I mean, AI can um, help us with. So um, I'll stop here. Thank, thank you. Um, and Jennifer, um, what, what do you do to encourage authentic engagement? And if you do, you know, incorporate AI in a related way, um, feel free to share that as well. So I tend to leave my hypothesis assignments very open-ended. And so I'm encouraging um, basic annotation techniques. So reactions, thoughts, um, comparisons of themselves, you know, within the text, um, giving them that space to ask questions. So you know, generally I'm just wanting them just to put it all out there and be open with each other. And obviously I'm not setting any parameters for, you know, language correctness. I just want them to engage. Um, in, in these classes that I'm teaching, I'm really not using AI because they are such basic language classes and basic writing classes and students are, you know, coming to college for the first time, sometimes after, you know, really struggling through high school um, writing classes as second language students um, and first generation students. So I really want them to start using their language and just be practicing their language. And so that type of, you know, I try to lower the effective filter so they're really engaging. Um, and with with the readings, I don't have a lot of OER texts. Um, my college used to use Bibliu, and so with that, I was able to have a, you know, a PDF of a, a a text, and I was able to use that. But I don't have that anymore. So it's really, um, if I'm uploading a PDF, then the students can read it. But otherwise, I'm not using that that much um, OER OER work. Thank you both. And there's a few questions about small group um, interaction toward the bottom of the Q&A. First, I wanted to get to um, one of our guests' questions at the top. Um, and I wanted to share just a few things because um, I think it's a transition between the previous question and this one. So this one is about um, 
strategies for encouraging students to participate in the annotation discussion when it opens and throughout the week or a couple of weeks or module rather than having students gather all of their annotations and wait till the end um, to post. And I have just a couple of strategies and then I'll hand it back to you. Um, but there's been some recent research about participatory roles. So giving, um, organizing the assignments into small reading groups, which the tool allows, you can use your LMS groups to enact small reading groups, and then perhaps assigning specific roles to students like um, facilitator, synthesizer, uh, person who's connecting to outside texts that they've read previously. So I think that that could be one way to encourage engagement from the beginning because different roles play um, uh, different parts throughout the week. The facilitator, I would imagine, is maybe responsible for in introducing the discussion and the ideas. So that could be um, one way. And then also, uh, there's um, possibly some modeling that we can do in face-to-face -face classes as well, if you're using this to supplement your face-to-face -face classes. So having kind of uh, more conversation about what does a successful like conversation look to like to you to students and they'll probably answer you know there's back and forth there's engaged question asking and then maybe um, we can talk with them about like how do we translate this into the margins so having those kinds of conversations could also help um, but i will I, since i'm not the star here i will hand it um, back to you both so how do you um, encourage engagement throughout the week i usually you know allow my students to have a few days to marinate in these topics so i like to leave them open for at least a week um, i haven't done the small group activities but i could see how that would be really helpful I've, i did the the hypothesis academy on ai a couple summers ago so i understand the ideas of you know taking this organic conversation and then having the students embed it in an assignment later. So they're actually, you know, less likely to be going out and finding um, ways to source text when they have it right here from this discussion. So I, I would definitely still like to try that. I haven't had that opportunity yet. And Jessica, um... For me, um, I do the role thing that you mentioned, which is wonderful, um, especially for dissertation proposals. So the ones who are sharing their dissertation proposal, they're like the they're the uh, orchestrator or the facilitator getting the feedback and also answering some of the questions that they may have. And then me as the instructor, I come in and um, follow up with some of the questions or answers that they're answering to kind of also give them the boost. Cause I know it's really difficult for students to give critical feedback to their peers. So I follow up with, you know, can you tell me more about that? Yes, it was unclear. You know, can we reword your uh, research question or this literature review is not complete, you know, and then we kind of go back and the students are able to do that. And the person who's the author of the dissertation proposal, they're able to come back and answer those questions in that academic uh, discourse that we are trying to promote um, outside and also inside um, uh, in our LMS as well, because we teach online, face-to-face, -face, and high flex. So uh, we have all those modalities. So in high hypothesis has allowed us to actually jump from those modalities and then continue to engage our students, especially in the dissertation phase, where it's a lonely process. Usually you're doing it all by yourself. So we have developed a uh, technique where there are students who are giving feedback, not just your chair or the committee members, but other students in the program willing to kind of give feedback so they're ready to get that critical feedback from the committee members. So it's been useful. That's amazing. Um, I know that not 
all graduate students offer that ability for or kind of like coordinating students to read each other's work. Um, so that's a that's a great idea about how to use the tool for those contexts. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to quickly answer some of these questions. Um, and so uh, there's one question, are students meeting in real time in groups? Um, so the tool is an asynchronous tool. So when I say that they are working in small groups, if you are using that um, setting in the tool, um, they're actually able to ask questions asynchronously. So one student could um, add a set of comments you know, in the morning, and then another student logs in in the evening, sees what they read, replies. So it's not a, like a synchronous um, experience necessarily where it's um, happening over Zoom or some other video platform. It's all text-based and it's happening asynchronously. Um, how, how large a group inter, um, interacts Okay, um, so I think this question might be asking the kind of ideal situation for small group numbers. So um, I think, Dr. Love, you since you use small groups, um, is there like an ideal like maximum and minimum if you are using the small group setting? Yeah, for me, uh, my experience so far has been probably minimum of four at least. And then I've had as many as probably about 15 students, which gets a little bit harder to manage, but it's been very fruitful depending on the topic and the area. So, um, but you do need, um, I don't know, uh, Jessica, I have to uh, probably refer to you. This is just purely from my experience, because I am, I'm, I'm excited to beta test and test some, pilot test some of these things, because um, I want our students to uh, feel supported and also learn from each other, especially if they're writing a dissertation. Um, I want them to be able to communicate and articulate. And also I wanna add to the fact that although it's asynchronous, I've used hypothesis synchronously via Zoom to get all my dissertation students together. And when they notate, you can see it pop up on the screen as well. So you don't, it's just pretty instant when the students actually put their comments in um, when we get together in real time, uh, whether or not it's in person or hybrid or um, uh, asynchronously. That's really helpful too. Um, I know that, uh some professors use it in kind of a flipped classroom situation that you're kind of describing where they'll even do that. The students will do the annotation work beforehand and then they come to class and kind of review all together, kind of alleviating some of the anxiety that some students might have about sharing like verbally aloud. Um, so that kind of sounds analogous. Um, so I'll try to wrap up our Q&A and then get back um, to a few of the spooky questions. Um, Jennifer, it looks like there's a couple for you about the speech um, that you described earlier. Um, so I know you mentioned you don't use small groups. How do you navigate like so many annotations on the document or do you have a, a strategy for that? And then when you, it sounds like you add some guiding annotations to that text, are students allowed to just simply reply or do you also expect them to make an original top level annotation? Yeah, for the linguistic classes um, where Hypothesis has substituted for a discussion board, in those assignments, the students are responsible for um, meeting the requirements, which are to highlight specific um, either sentences or linguistic acts. I also use it for my syntax assignment where they're looking at Chomsky's, uh, Noam Chomsky's Wikipedia page, and they're analyzing for sentence structure, and they need to find different types of syntactical structure. Um, so yes, the students are responsible for finding that content. 
and then reporting it in their annotation and then replying to others on the either the correctness or um, their interpretation. There's there's a lot of leeway in terms of the replies, but with the students' postings, it's much more um, guided. And I have at least you know a whole page of how to go about doing that. Um, the other thing I would say is in a community college with you know with new students, 17, 18 years old. I'm really having a lot of face-to-face -face tutoring um, with writing assignments. So I think if I had, you know, higher level students in maybe bigger classes, you know, I would probably use more group work tools, but because the emphasis is really on learning how to write and write well, we have so many, you know, resources for tutoring here. So um, the student engagement, is really most effective for me with my online classes, although I have used it in some hybrid high flex classes too, where I can see the students' questions ahead of time, and then I can answer them, you know, beyond that in the classroom if it still is, um, is an issue for them. Thank you so much. I will dip back into the uh, spooky questions and then I will come back um, to the Q&A. So have no fear, I will be um, back to ask the, the Q&A question that's there. Um, I did want to ask, can you share a moment in your class when social annotation turned a potential trick, so I guess this would be like an obstacle that students might face into a treat, so perhaps like a student success, um, and improved understanding in a surprising way. And I'll, um, I'll ask this of Dr. Love first. Not a problem. I think the, um, the trick into a treat. Um, initially, I wasn't so sure how well uh, the uh, hypothesis will be received by my students uh, because I do love learning technology and trying to infuse it in the classroom to increase engagement. What um, Jennifer is mentioning, I think the whole idea of learning, learning should be enjoyable, not uh, really stressful, but if you're in a setting where you have a community, it helps to alleviate that fear, anxiety, that stress, because you could go complain to your classmates like, ah. Oh. And um, so the fear was the fact that the students wouldn't accept another uh, tool set, because I use a lot of them to engage our students. Um, and the it became a treat just because the students initially said, oh, Dr. Love, not another one. And I said, let's just try it, please. Like, I think it's, uh, you like social media, writing, and they just, um, you know, they started using it. And another thing was they didn't want to share their work because they were like, I'm not quite sure if my writing is good enough or my um, comments are intellectual enough to like be uh, at the level that you, you know, you are expecting us to be. And, you know, as a graduate student, you are learning through the process. And thank you for, uh, you know, professors like Jennifer in early stages where they're getting the foundation um, because I get them after she teaches them and I'm able to do that higher level work. And it became a treat when we had the opportunity to present uh, what we're doing for the last uh, year and a half, I think 18 months of trying out hypothesis, students actually volunteered to present with me to talk about their experience, how it fostered trust, engagement, um, and also kind of uh, giving feedback in a way that was relatable and also collaborative and compassionate as well, that it uh, allowed them to grow as a writer and also a scholar to gain that confidence that um, even some of us, I, even for me, I'm constantly like, oh, I have to read this article, that article, because there's so many things that are out there. So it became a treat and my students uh, cannot wait to use it again. I mean, we're using it again this semester and they were like, well, if you have to present again, we will <laughs> volunteer to talk about our experience. So. Uh, it became um, from a trick into a treat with uh, really positive um, engagement and also the trust, that psychological safety that you need to talk about 
some of the critical issues that um, we're not on we're not able to talk about in classrooms. Like you have to have that engagement and trust uh, among your peers and also with the faculty member. And it happened pretty quickly with the hypothesis because there's uh, so much engagement. So thank you. Thank you. And Jennifer, how did you turn a trick into a treat? When I when I thought about that question a couple of days ago, I was really kind of racking my brain. But what comes to mind is um, avoiding plagiarism, teaching students how to use proper formatting and cite uh, sources. And a couple years ago, when I was doing the pilot with Hypothesis, I had this wonderful embedded librarian, and I gave her you know, some full reign. And she was like, I'd like to do a hypothesis with the Purdue OWL. And their formatting um, guidance is just stellar, which I've used for years. And so that has become a staple of my course now, both with face-to-face -face classes and with online classes, because I've never been able to really effectively engage with students over MLA formatting, which is required in all writing classes. And just to have them ask those nitpicky questions and to see, you know, the really, the clear examples that the Purdue OWL sets up, I think it has really taken that part of my class to a new level. And I'm really grateful for that ability to annotate websites just just for that one alone because it it made life so much easier um, for my writing students and for me. Thank you for sharing that. That's a great idea. So my understanding is you and for those of you who might be new to uh, social annotation, you, students are able to annotate on top of websites. So my understanding is you're taking a specific um, web page from the Purdue OWL and then having students like ask questions about the different formatting that the Purdue OWL is explaining. Is that kind of the idea there? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Specific questions, you know, even periods and commas. <laughs> and actually um, to tag on to that, can you say more about the questions that the librarian posed, like uh, if they were a part of that activity? So, you know, that again is is one of the low stakes activities. So it's really just about annotating. So asking questions, um, making, uh, posing statements about is this similar or different to what I've learned. Um, it's I just try to leave it very open ended and not not guide it that much because I really want them to look at the entire page and just comment on whatever um, they have a reaction to or they have a question about because I think it's really important for them to just come up with ideas in an organic fashion um, so that I can just I can reply to the students when there is a question that I'm seeing other students are not um, are not answering very well so I'm always monitoring these uh, hypothesis annotation assignments more so than I ever would a discussion board because it's so easy to see where the questions are, how how and when to jump in, and so you can just you know tackle them right there um, before they blow up and become big issues. Thank you for that. And I'm going to dip into the Q&A for two questions, and then there will be one last um, spooky question. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. So um, to tag on to that, and I'll, Jennifer, I might like ask you to answer this as well, because I think it's related. Um, how do you stay on top of um, student annotations? This person uses another tool that can be set up to auto grade. Um, and they feel like they have a hard time getting into look in a timely ma manner. Um, and I will say that we ha do have auto grading um, being released later this year. So the person who um, asked that question, do look out for our auto grading setting, which is unrolling soon. Um, but Jennifer, how do you stay on top of those conversations? So if I'm opening um, the assignment and I give them a week to do it, 
Um, I don't want it due on a Sunday because I know I'm not going to be jumping in and answering questions on a Sunday. So I will typically make it due on a day that I know that I'm, I'm relatively free and I can jump in. And um, so hopefully the students that post early, I can look at what they're saying. And then the students who wait more to the last minute, I can jump in. And I also have been known to add replies when I'm doing speed grader after the fact. So when I'm grading it in my LMS, sometimes I'll, I'll do a quick, quick reply to those students in the hopes that people will go back and see if their questions were answered. Um, but yeah, it, it, can, it can be tricky. I wouldn't personally do auto grading because I do wanna see my students' knowledge gaps. And so that's why I'm really taking the time to monitor it. Thank you. Um, I think for expediency, I will go on to the next question, which I'm going to um, pose to you, Dr. Love, and then we'll um, get to the final Halloween question. Um, so have you found that the social aspect of the tool is negatively impacted by text difficulty? And this person is wondering about changes in uh, student interactivity with simpler text versus like peer reviewed journal articles. Um, so the question is, um, have I seen any negative impact with just having text in annotation? Is that is that the question? I, I think it's more um, like, do students seem to engage more with simpler text? Have you encountered difficulties when you're assigning like long journal articles, that kind, the difference between conversations that happens between those types of um, readings? Exactly. Oh, that's a wonderful question. So um, I do some of the low stake uh, questions and readings, such as the website, where there's there may be a website that I would allow you to kind of uh, comment on anything and everything more open ended. So it would be um, complete or not complete, but not necessarily looking at the quality per se. So in terms of the more complicated articles, indeed, the engagement is tougher, especially if you're asking people to read uh, complex peer-reviewed articles and also dissertation proposals that are about 20 pages to 50 pages, right? So, um, so what's been happening is, for me, I give them incentive in terms of kind of um, giving them time. I ask them to read the first five pages and come back, like what... Uh, Jennifer is mentioning, we're not asking them to read the whole thing all at once. I give them enough time and giving that scaffolding to ensure that they're reading those articles. I rather have students read good four articles as opposed to 20 articles uh, in a given time. So um, always looking at the time factor and engagement factor to figure out what is my outcome? What am, what am I trying to have my students do? So there is that there is a fine balance. So indeed, the engagement for the harder articles are definitely lower, but I try to make it so it ties into their other assignments and readings to make them engage more and also giving them some incentive and also collaborative uh, push as well, like social pressure <laughs> to... <laughs> get them to annotate, but that's a wonderful, wonderful question. I really appreciate your point about scaffolding, like different parts of the text, maybe for one week and then the next week. Um, that's, that's really a helpful um, piece of advice. So I'm going to pose our very last question, which I really want to know, and it is, if you had a crystal ball how do you see social annotation evolving in the coming years? And I will, um, sorry, I will pose that to Jennifer first. You know, I was just really excited to see what hypothesis rolled out this academic year with all of the different ways to um, use it. I mean, I've really enjoyed um, just practicing those new ways that um, hypothesis can overlay into my Canvas course. Um, I, you know, 
Dr. Love mentioned being able to look at longer documents, and there's a huge push right now to have OER, online educational resources, and um, being able to look at multiple pages in a row, like look at a whole chapter. Um, I think for me, that would be really advantageous. I do have one class where I am using an OER text. It's uh, English for Careers and Technical Writing. And it would be really nice to just to be go to go in and look at various parts of a chapter with them, um, because right now, you know, it's just it's laborious to, you know, to look at one page with them. So um, that that's that would be my request. That's what I'd like to see coming next. Thank you. Um, yeah, and there's room to grow with um, the OER interactivity, but I appreciate that idea. Um, and Dr. Love, um, what's in your crystal ball? Yeah, no, I, it's, I think it just, even with the short period of time, all the advances, and I I am uh, very interested in this auto grading. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, that is wonderful. But peering into the future, I do see social annotation becoming more interactive, especially uh, potential for the supernatural AI integration that can provide students with some resources or summaries or even suggested connections that they may annotate. Because I think there's so much information that's out there, but it's filtered through the use of, you know, with the faculty who's uh, knowing the subject matter expert and um, the ethical use of using all that in conjunction with hypothesis team and in that imagining like hypothesis being able to prompt students with some of the questions to help because like what some of the um, audience member were saying like how do you handle all these prompts and questions and etc so I wondered if they uh, there's a way to kind of use AI as a tool to be a partner in some ways to kind of work with some of the replies, questions, and uh, me in terms of dissertation topics, kind of working with peers on similar areas and suggesting some connections and becoming more of a magical tool of, uh, for me, the hypothesis tool has been one of those magical tools for building belonging and inclusion, as well as resiliency, because I think failure in academia is not necessarily a failure, it's a learning process. So I think using the hypothesis tools to help people build up when they make mistakes have been really, really um, important. So having all those fancy tools along with our uh, human touch, it's been, um, that's what I see as a crystal ball where I think human-centered uh, approach is what I think Hypothesis is doing where even with all the fancy things that are being integrated, I don't think we're going to go away. They need us as faculty and students to engage into the tool uh, to make things even better, so. Thank you for that. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, a lot of ways that this tool um, supports good pedagogy that you're already doing in terms of um, teaching students to develop those kind of um, inquiry-based perspectives um, as a you know student academic that kind of thing. And I hear that in your answer there. Um, I am going to switch to our very last um, slides here. Um, Hopefully I get to the right screen. Um, and there was one last question about using social annotation and face-to-face -face live classes. Um, and I'll just answer this offhand, but um, we do have faculty who use this both for asynchronous and synchronous online. And then also, um, I actually think that Jennifer and Dr. Love mentioned that um, in it, this can be used for flip cla flipped classroom activities as well as in-class activities as well, especially if you have the technology available where you're able to project 
um, the screen as annotations come in from maybe different small groups that are working with each other, that kind of thing. Um, so yes, very adaptable and flexible. Um, I just wanted to mention before we go, and thank you to both of our panelists, um, do check out Hypothesis Academy if you're um, not uh, familiar. Um, it's an asynchronous course, very low stakes. I'm the facilitator and I'm very nice. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, but it's a great low stakes way to get familiar with the tool. Um, and then if you're interested in learning more, we have a quick start um, promotion with discounted pricing and no cost implementation. There's an email education at hypothesis.is if you want to reach out for that. But thank you um, so much um, for attending. Thank you, Jennifer and Dr. Love. Um, I always learn so much. So I really, really appreciate your time and I hope you have a happy Halloween. <laughs> See ya. Thank you. Happy Halloween. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. And thank you all who attended. And Bill, um, uh, check out the education at hypotha.is and we can see if your school has a subscription um, and other means of getting involved if, um, if you don't yet have a partnership. <laughs>